Moby Dick, by Herman Melville. Chapter 102. A Bower in the Arsacides. Hitherto, in descriptively treating of the sperm whale, I have chiefly dwelt upon the marvels of his outer aspect, or separately and in detail upon some few interior structural features. But to a large and thorough sweeping comprehension of him, it behooves me now to unbutton him still further, and untagging the points of his hose, unbuckling his garters, and casting loose the hooks and the eyes of the joints of his innermost bones, set him before you in his ultimatum, that is to say, in his unconditional skeleton. But how now, Ishmael? How is it, that you, a mere oarsman in the fishery, pretend to know aught about the subterranean parts of the whale? Did erudite stub, mounted upon your capstan, deliver lectures on the anatomy of the Siddhachaya, and by help of the windlass, hold up a specimen rib for exhibition? Explain thyself, Ishmael. Can you land a full-grown whale on your deck for examination? as a cook dishes a roast pig? Surely not. A veritable witness have you hitherto been, Ishmael, but have a care how you seize the privilege of Jonah alone, the privilege of discoursing upon the joists and beams, the rafters, ridge pole, sleepers, and underpinnings, making up the framework of Leviathan, and bell-like of the tallow vats, dairy rooms, butteries, and cheese reefs in his bowels. I confess, that since Jonah, few whalemen have penetrated very far beneath the skin of the adult whale, nevertheless, I have been blessed with an opportunity to dissect him in miniature. In a ship I belong to, a small cub sperm whale was once bodily hoisted to the deck for his poke or bag, to make sheaths for the barbs of the harpoons, and for the heads of the lances. Think you I let that chance go, without using my boat hatchet and jackknife? and breaking the seal and reading all the contents of that young cub. And as for my exact knowledge of the bones of the Leviathan in their gigantic, full-grown development, for that rare knowledge I am indebted to my late royal friend Tranquo, King of Trank, one of the Arsacides. For being at Trank, years ago, when attached to the trading ship Day of Algiers, I was invited to spend part of the Arsacidean holidays with the Lord of Trank, at his retired palm villa at Papella, a seaside glen not very far distant from what our sailors call Bamboo Town, his capital. Among many other fine qualities, my royal friend Tranquil, being gifted with a devout love for all matters of barbaric virtue, had brought together in Papella whatever rare things the more ingenious of his people could invent, chiefly carved woods of wonderful devices, chiseled shells, and laid spears costly paddles, aromatic canoes, and all these distributed among whatever natural wonders, the wonder freighted, tribute-rendering waves had cast upon his shores. Chief among these latter was a great sperm whale, which, after an unusually long raging gale, had been found dead and stranded, with his head against a cocoa-nut tree, whose plumage-like, tufted drooping seemed his verdant jet. When the vast body had at last been stripped of its fathom-deep enfoldings, and the bones become dust dry in the sun, then the skeleton was carefully transported up the Papella Glen, where a grand temple of lordly palms now sheltered it. The ribs were hung with trophies, the vertebrae were carved with arsacidae in annals, in strange hieroglyphics, in the skull, the priest kept up an unextinguished aromatic flame, so that the mystic head again sent forth its vapory spout, while, suspended from a bough, the terrific lower jaw vibrated over all the devotees, like the hair-hung sword that so frighted Damocles. It was a wondrous sight. The wood was green as mosses of the icy glen, the trees stood high and haughty, feeling their living sap, the industrious earth beneath was as a weaver's loom, with the gorgeous carpet on it, whereof the ground vine tendrils formed the warp and woof, and the living flowers the figures. All the trees, with all their laden branches, all the shrubs, and ferns, and grasses, the message-carrying air, all these unceasingly were active. Through the lacings of the leaves, the great sun seemed a flying shuttle weaving the unwearied verdure. Oh! Busy weaver. Unseen weaver. Pause.
One word. Whither flows the fabric? What palace may it deck? Wherefore all these ceaseless toilings? Speak, weaver. Stay thy hand. But one single word with thee. Nay, the shuttle flies. The figures float from forth the loom. The F-R-E-S-H-E-T rushing carpet forever slides away. The weaver god, he weaves. And by that weaving is he deafened, that he hears no mortal voice. And by that humming, we, too, who look on the loom are deafened. And only when we escape it shall we hear the thousand voices that speak through it. For even so it is in all material factories. The spoken words that are inaudible among the flying spindles. Those same words are plainly heard without the walls, bursting from the opened casements. Thereby have villainies been detected. Ah, mortal! Then, be heedful. For so, in all this din of the great world's loom, thy subtlest thinkings may be overheard afar. Now, amid the green, life-restless loom of that arsacidian wood, the great, white, worshipped skeleton lay lounging, a gigantic idler. Yet, as the ever-woven verdant warp and woof intermixed and hummed around him, the mighty idler seemed the cunning weaver, himself all woven over with the vines, every month assuming greener, fresher verdure, but himself a skeleton. Life folded death, death trellised life, the grim god wived with youthful life, and begat him curly-headed glories. Now, when with royal tranquil I visited this wondrous whale, and saw the skull and altar, and the artificial smoke ascending from where the real jet had issued, I marveled that the king should regard the chapel as an object of virtu. He laughed. But more I marveled that the priests should swear that smoky jet of his was genuine. To and fro I paced before this skeleton, brushed the vines aside, broke through the ribs, and with the ball of arsacidian twine, wandered, added long amid its many winding, shaded colonnades and arbors. But soon my line was out, and following it back, I emerged from the opening where I entered. I saw no living thing within, naught was there but bones. Cutting me a green measuring rod, I once more dived within the skeleton. From their arrows lit in the skull, the priests perceived me taking the altitude of the final rib. How now? They shouted. D.A.R. Street thou measure this our god. That's for us. I, priests, well, how long do you make them, then? But hereupon a fierce contest rose among them, concerning feet and inches. They cracked each other's sconces with their yard dash sticks dash dash the great skull echoed, and seizing that lucky chance, I quickly concluded my own and measurements. These and measurements I now propose to set before you. But first, be it recorded, that, in this matter, I am not free to utter any fancied measurement I please, because there are skeleton authorities you can refer to, to test my accuracy. There is a Leviathanic Museum, they tell me, in Hull, England, one of the whaling ports of that country, where they have some fine specimens of finbacks and other whales. Likewise, I have heard that in the Museum of Manchester, in New Hampshire, they have what the proprietors call the only perfect specimen of a Greenland or river whale in the United States. Moreover, at a place in Yorkshire, England, Burton Constable by name, a certain Sir Clifford Constable has in his possession the skeleton of a sperm whale, but of moderate size, by no means of the full-grown magnitude of my friend King Tranquo's. In both cases, the stranded whales to which these two skeletons belonged, were originally claimed by their proprietors upon similar grounds. King Tranquo seizing his because he wanted it, and Sir Clifford, because he was lord of the signories of those parts. Sir Clifford's whale has been articulated throughout, so that, like a great chest of drawers, you can open and shut him, in all his bony cavities, spread out his ribs like a gigantic fan, and swing all day upon his lower jaw. Locks are to be put upon some of his trap doors and shutters, and a footman will show round future visitors with a bunch of keys at his side. Sir Clifford thinks of charging twopence for a peep at the whispering gallery in the spinal column, 
threepence to hear the echo in the hollow of his cerebellum, and sixpence for the unrivaled view from his forehead. The skeleton dimensions I shall now proceed to set down are copied verbatim from my right arm, where I had them tattooed. As in my wild wanderings at that period, there was no other secure way of preserving such valuable statistics. But as I was crowded for space, and wished the other parts of my body to remain a blank page for a poem I was then composing, at least, what untattooed parts might remain, I did not trouble myself with the odd inches, nor, indeed, should inches at all enter into a congenial measurement of the whale.